Good morning, everyone. So you've heard that making maps in DHIS2 is easy. You've also gotten to see a lot of the really fantastic features within the Maps app. And you've also seen that there's a lot of really powerful data that's made available to DHIS2 users through a tool like Google Earth Engine, so population data and earth science data, which coupled with the routine information that you have in your DHIS2 instances can make very powerful maps. You also heard though that the Maps app is one of the analytics tools that's the most relatively least used within the DHIS2 platform. So we wanted to learn more about what are the reasons behind the limited usage by gathering insights from the field. So we started a collaboration about a year and a half ago, including UNICEF, Grid3, the HISP Center, HISP South Africa, and Ministries of Health, and HISPs in five countries in East and Southern Africa, Kenya, Uganda, Rwanda, Mozambique, and Zambia. And again, the idea was to understand why the app is relatively limited in use, and also what are some of the current practices in the field and how can this be supported better within the existing functionality? The results today reflect the inputs of many individuals, some captured in the slide pictures, some in the room today, and some that are joining remotely. And so we hope you'll be inspired by some of what you see today as the results of what you can do with some capacity strengthening and leveraging some of the functionality within DHIS2. And then you'll be part of the community that we're building here to strengthen map use. So again, uh, a strong motivation behind this collaboration Bjorn shared some of the data that's made available, for example, through WorldPOP, innovative data that's very granular and can be aggregated to different units of analysis. And we see that there's a strong demand to represent data spatially. And again, we heard from Scott that this does require special skills around how to represent data spatially and how to use and interpret that data. But again, we understand that uh, there's limited use of this information. So we wanted to get insights from the field and uh, identify what are those opportunities to strengthen map usage. So we convened in Nairobi last November and we brought together Ministry of Health from Kenya and Uganda, including program staff and HMIS staff we brought together DHIS2 developers, and we brought together population modelers, along with HISPs that support implementation in these countries. And we used a range of different modalities to facilitate dialogue. The dialogue and discussion was really important. Again, to find out what are the, some of the current practices in the field, what are some opportunities to improve, and where users were having some challenges or constraints in using the DHIS2 platform, Maps app. So what did we learn? As you heard earlier today, we know that facilities in terms of using data and also in districts like to have map printouts. And we found out that the functionality in DHIS2 in terms of downloading and printing maps had opportunities for improvement specifically around some of the labeling, the download options, and the layout. And so as you heard today in the latest release of DHIS2, this was one of the features that was prioritized. That was a direct result of some of the consultations that happened. Again, having the diverse group of people, the ministries, implementation support teams, and also with the exchange of population modeling team and others. We also found out that the process for signing up for Google Earth Engine was very cumbersome. 
And so again, while many users may have known that these features existed, just as you learned today, there were challenges in setting up the access, the sign up for Google Earth Engine and DHIS2 in the national instances. So again, this became apparent from the dialogue that took place. And now the process is simplified. And since November, there have been 18 countries that have now enabled these, this feature in the national DHIS2 instances. You also heard earlier today about the need for capacity strengthening around map making, interpretation, and use. We learned from the field that users would like to have more skills development in this area. And also that um, they were not always clear what are the possibilities of representing data spatially and how this might differ from analytics and charts. We also learned that users wanted to have ongoing capacity strengthening given turnover of staff and also the need to scale and sustain. This isn't a one-off thing. So one of the things that we did working with HIF South Africa was to develop an online Moodle course that can also be further adapted for national your, if you happen to use MOOC in, uh, Moodle in your countries. That provides some principles around GIS and introduction around how to use the Maps app. We also developed a Level 2 Maps Academy, and Sylvia will be sharing more in a little bit around what's possible in terms of with, uh, in a short amount of time, some fantastic maps that I hope you all will be inspired by. We also learned that there's a challenge of data. So data availability, particularly population data at the lowest levels of the system and issues with missing facility coordinates and also with misplaced coordinates and having updated shape files or administrative boundaries to represent changes over time. And for example, district formation. So all these things are realities that will come up when, for example, making maps, but one of the important lessons that emerged is that by highlighting these issues by using the data, it's created greater demand in terms of improving the geodata in DHIS2, and also a greater demand for using some of the innovative population and earth science data that we have been sharing. So with that, I'm gonna turn over to my colleague, Sylvia, who's gonna be sharing more about the Maps Academy. Um, thanks, Maria, and good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Sylvia Wren. I'm a GIS consultant with UNICEF and Grid3. So um, if you have any GIS-related questions around data or GIS, um, come see me. Um, I'm, I'm around. Um, so I just wanted to give you a quick overview of the Level 2 Maps Academy that we did in Cape Town. Um, which was maybe a little bit different than some of the other academies that have been held. So first of all, we spent a lot of time trying to make sure we get the right mix of people to attend. Um, and this was not just the technical teams. We really wanted some program staff and decision makers within the programs there as well. Um, and we wanted them to come from the same country. So if a country was present, it would be both the technical and the data use teams um, that, that, that were invited and that came to this Level 2 Maps Academy. We had some pre-course requirements. Um, one of them was that they needed to have done a Level 1 Academy um, and that they took a Moodle um, which was an online maps course so that they already had some foundations before they came in to this academy. We did also make sure that the use cases were based on, um, on use cases that they were using or needing in country within the next few months. Um, so, so the maps that they produce, and I'll show some examples uh, in the later slides, were some that they would be using back home. We also used the country databases. So we didn't use um, Sierra Leone or, or Laos. We used um, the, all the country teams were able to use their own instances. We had some really fun activities. So we also tried out the tracker um, where we mapped ice cream shops within Cape Town. Um, and this was mainly because a lot of people, they see these, these raster layers with population in them and they don't really know what to do with that. 
So we had people go out and estimate populations around ice cream shops. Um, we also have supported with the online learning. So that was the Moodle I mentioned, and we will be following up with participants as well. Um, if you're more interested in this Level 2 Maps Academy um, and, and some of the, uh, the things we did, then Nora will be talking about this in a lot more detail um, in tomorrow's session. Sorry, everyone, uh, we're having some internet instability, and if you're not, um, you don't have something essential you have to do with your computers, we'd appreciate it if you're not doing anything that's high bandwidth, because we're trying to make sure we keep the stream going, which is crashing at the moment, so we'd appreciate it if you just shut down any high bandwidth activity, that would be great. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, so I just wanted to show a few maps that were made by the participants, and please keep in mind that while some of them have done the level one maps academy these are not gis experts um so these are people that are using um mostly the the dhis2 maps app um with some of their data and based on discussions that they had with their program staff that were also um within this maps academy so this is a um a map of uganda um that shows the women of childbearing age and the anc4 coverage and here you will see the, the black is and the gray is the, the women of childbearing age per hectare. Um, and maybe just to add to that, this is really powerful because it shows you the location of populations. Whether it's six or 10 women there, is, is, it's not that accurate. Um, especially a lot of this is 2020 data. It's it's kind of a top-down approach, which uh, you can look at more on the World Pop website. But for the first time, I think um, some of the DHIS2 users can actually see where people are um, in in their catchment or in their districts. Um, they've they've put uh, facility distribution on there as well, um, and then they can kind of see the ANC coverage. They've also then made a map to look at the number of deliveries and saw that a lot of, while we do have um, women who are doing ANC visits, it, there's a good possibility that they're traveling quite far um, up to the north there to actually um, have, have the babies. This is an example of Lesotho. Um, this one actually won the MAPS competition. Um, and here you can also see some of the level of detail that these MAPS can give you. Um, we're getting a lot of requests from countries to do geo-enabled microplanning. Um, so to kind of get catchment area maps that do have a lot of detail. Um, and here you can see you can see a lot of detail in 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 the um in the yellow, the, the yellow boundaries. I think I'm hoping you can see them. Um, those are the catchment areas that were generated by the crosscut app. Um, and then they also showed the home deliveries. Um, by uh, by using the bubble map there. So you can see St. Joseph's catchment has a high number of home deliveries. And then they use the new ANC clients data as well um, to show how many new clients are there actually within that catchment area that's showing a lot of home deliveries. And then they also use the um, how many of them are under 20 years of age because there's a high maternal mortality um, in, in that district in, in general. Um, here's another example of the map where, where they use the, um, the Penta 1 data together with population, um, and they used uh, two kilometer buffers to, to look at where our population that are over 10 kilometers um, away from our health facility. And again, these are basically map newbies, um, you know, being able to do this um, in the DHIS2. Here we have an example from Zambia um, where they're just kind of drilling down to say, well, Northern province actually looks pretty good. It's in the green. But when we then look at the districts of the Northern province, we can see that there is um, at least one district who is, who is underperforming in, in the coverage. Um, here in Tanzania, we have an example of MR1 coverage um, where we can also see um, you know, where, there, where there's increased coverage in the blue um, and then low coverage in the areas around uh, where we have increased coverage, which, which may be an indicator that the, the people from those areas are going into, um, for example, Kibiti 
um, to, to get their to get their vaccines. We had an interesting example from South Africa um, where they were exploring the population data and in an area which they thought they knew fairly well. Um, and you can see this is a very remote area. You don't see a lot, you don't see roads or anything. Um, and they actually did find populations in that area um, that they said when they went home, they're gonna need to explore that because they'd never actually gone out there. Um, this is an example of the population data in an urban area, also an example from South Africa, um, where they were looking at the TB rates and they looked at the population under five years of age and, and, and just kind of looked at that together uh, in, in the urban area. We've already had a uh, follow-up from Zambia. Uh, they wrote into the community of practice, I think, which, which is great, um, that they have been um, showing the districts how to use the MAPS app to understand performance within their districts. So here we can see them in the district office um, and one of the people that attended the MAPS Academy just kind of passing on that knowledge and, and using um, the MAPS app. What's next? Um, come to the session by Nora tomorrow afternoon um, and we can discuss this further. Um, please also join the MAPS community of practice on the DHIS2 community. Um, here you can upload your MAPS, or if you have questions on making MAPS, it doesn't just have to be on DHIS2, it can be in QGIS as well, um, if it's kind of routine data related, um, then, then please do join that. There is also a MAPS, a really great MAPS app Moodle course developed by HISP South Africa. Um, which you can sign up to and do in one or two hours, and it will really show you the features that are available. Um, if you would like to sign up to that, you'll get a certificate. Um, please contact Nora. Nora, I don't. I think most people know you, but maybe you can uh, wave or, or stand up really quickly. Uh, please contact Nora, and, and she'll make sure that she can get you signed up. Um, there's more to come, so we'll we'll have some more uh, e-learning Moodles videos and jobs aids. And since the health facility locations are so important to a lot of the maps uh, that we see that are, are being made and requested, um, there'll also be a health facility coordinate checker uh, that's coming. That's it from me. Um, thank you. Okay, so... Um... That was the, that's all the presentation we had. Just one thing I wanted to emphasize about the last presentation was a lot of times people ask us, how do we come up with the features that we put into DHIS2? Sometimes it's very opaque process. Um, you know, it's not, this is not the Willy Wonka chocolate factory where we just kind of dream up our own, uh, sorry, movie book reference that maybe not everybody gets. But anyways, the, the point is that I hope you noticed from the presentation how we actually tried to convene a workshop to understand where the barriers were and to then immediately bring those barriers back into new functionality. And that's kind of what we try to do for all of the apps and uh, everything we develop in DHIS2. We don't, don't, we don't just dream it up. There has to be a real need. There has to be an actual implementation. And we don't actually even have the resources there to do like cool, fun things that we think would just be interesting. There has to be a use case. There has to be someone specifically asking for it. I need this functionality because I need to use DHIS2 in this way. So, um, so if you're, hopefully that gives you a little bit of insight. And if you'd like to be more involved, engaged in the, say, the development of the Maps app and giving us requirements, uh, we're the folks to talk to. We can bring you into the community practice where we have a continuous dialogue about the latest functionality and things that you think need to be there and what other folks are using the Maps app for. And so we're very happy to invite anyone and everyone here to join that community. And um, if you go on to the community practice, community.dhis2.org, there is under the implementation thread, a link just for the Maps community. So please join that and, um, and we'll, we'll, have, we'll keep the conversation going. Now, somehow by the grace of God, we've ended early. And I think that gives us a very unique opportunity to have questions. So, yeah, sorry, we should have warned you, Max. You, Max. <laughs> so we, we covered the new functionality, we covered um, capacity building, and we covered some examples. Does anyone have any questions? Raise your hand. Someone's got to break the ice. 
Yeah. Would you, oh, sorry, Joseph has a question. Right here. All right. Yeah. <laughs> You're probably going to reference a bug that we haven't fixed yet or something. Yeah, thank you, uh, Joseph from Malawi. Yeah, it's a great uh, new development, um, but with regards to the GIS, uh, I think the key thing is about the whole data source and how we are going to manage the shape file and all the metadata. So I don't know, do we have some somewhere that um, like a global repository where we can easily access uh, all sort of like population and even with the climbing weather data, and then that we can uh, further use it. And also like from the country's perspective, like we also generate the local uh, the local maps and the local data, like the health facility, we have our master health facility registry. So how, how we can sort of like um, creating the synergy, not only within the country, but maybe within the region and also the continent and even worldwide so that uh, people can benefit out of this. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, it's a tricky question. There are various resources to finding good, uh, good data. Um, speak up. <laughs> uh, so there is a site called GADM, G-A-D-M, uh, which have boundaries. Uh, I would also advise you to come to the, we'll be more specific about resources. Uh, we will be more specific about resources when we have the meeting tomorrow. Uh, to finding this shapes file, for example. Um, I can also say you that the, this process of getting new boundary data into DHS2 has been quite complex. If you have ever dealt with it, in 239, it's much easier. Uh, so we have improved that workflow. So I see some happy, happy faces here. Thanks. Um, maybe if I can add to that as well. So there are um, various global repositories. Um, Geo Boundaries is a really good one. Um, it has GADAM data in it, but here you can compare boundaries from different resources um, and at different administrative levels. Um, so you can compare them directly to see which ones match your country best. Um, we have the Grid3 website, which has settlement extents for all uh, countries. You have hot OSM, um, for health facilities. What I can do on the MAPS uh, community of practice, I can maybe add some of the global repositories that um, we would recommend for you to have a look at. Please do remember that if they are global repositories, they may not match the national data that you might get from your health facility master list or from your Ministry of Lands in terms of boundaries. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind when using the global data sets. Um, but there is a lot available. Yeah. Just to add one thing is that as part of this collaboration, we have been working with a number of different countries to create what we call bespoke modeled population data sets. And there are also other layers of interest, for example, like the roads that are not available in Google Earth Engine, you may have your local data. So I do think that that is still something that we need to sort out is how we can make available in some kind of repository some of this data so that you can use the data from you, that you would prefer from your countries, for example, if you want different data than the one made globally consistently available through WorldPOP. So again, something that we would like to explore in the near future, working with DHIS2 team and others. And this is also something we will cover in the session tomorrow. So it's at two o'clock. It's in the technical track. Don't be afraid that it's too technical. It's basically uh, more how to learn about maps than actually learning the complex GIS and, and tools. So don't be frightened for joining. All right, uh, thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Lawrence uh, Flank Nyambalo from Malawi. I'm from the expanded program immunization. I was equally interested when I heard about uh, microplanning. And uh, I just want to compliment 
uh, on what my colleague has actually said again on the same. So in immunization, we are so much interested in uh, access and utilization. So I was also considering to say uh, on the uh, geospatial tracking system, where much we are using again um, geospatial microplanning to say, don't you see that also as a need to say, maybe if we might also bring in a system, the GTS, where you'd be able to actually track to look at um, maybe the vaccinators as they are trying to reach out to the, um, uh, the children. Maybe you've already done your micro planning and then you need to find out to say, um, will the uh, vaccinator be able to track each and every child so that we really work again on the um, utilization and, uh, and of course accessibility. So I don't know on your micro planning, uh, your special micro planning, how do you plan to get to those levels where you have to also consider the geospatial data? I don't know. Don't you see that as a need in the near future? Over. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's 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 a good question. Thank you for that. Um, I'm not sure how far the tracker app can be used, like the. The GTS. I know the GTS has a has a, a dashboard um, that can be used and that shows you how to track. Um, and, and and it uses some of like I think it uses the settlement extents as well um, to show you where you've been um, and, and areas you've covered. Um, you can obviously use that data and 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 bring it into QGIS and then take data from from the DHIS too and then also add that to QGIS. So that is possible now. Um, in terms of linking the GTS with DHIS2, maybe that's something to, to ask for. No, it's good feedback. And, and we have been looking more into aggregate data than to individual based data so far. I think the, there is a tracked entity layer also in MapsApp, but it should be really get some more love and, and focus. Uh, so there are possibilities and people are using it. And you have the the... The, the app where you can capture coordinates, even multiple coordinates uh, for the for some like contact tracing and so on, but it's still limited. So I think often still you depend on, on moving into another system to, to, do, to do this anal analysis. Uh, would you like to add something? Yeah, just to point out that um, planning and micro planning is one of our Uh oh. Be careful with your toes, everybody. <laughs> Sorry, Kristen. <laughs> I think there's quite a few doctors in the room. <laughs> if we need any. <laughs> okay. Um, so, what I was going to say was um, that micro planning is a key use case for us. It's a specifically, we are really analyzing the functionalities that are required to be able to conduct micro planning all the way down to health facility community level in countries and making sure that DHIS2 has all of the necessary functionality. It's a process and there's different ways, that there are different types of micro planning. So you have different plans for like immunization, you may also have different kinds of micro planning approaches for other types of outreach services like, like uh, insecticide net distribution or maternal uh, follow-up, et cetera. But we are part of a global community that's analyzing digital tools for micro planning. And, um, and if your country is going to do any micro planning and considering to using DHS2 for it, please keep, uh, please talk to us, tell us what you need, what you have, what you don't have, and then we can kind of go through the process together. But it is a key use case that we're, we're aiming to cover. I do want to mention two examples that we had pre presented earlier. This one's from Uganda, and if you remember, and Uganda is actually able to use this map to inform micro planning. They have micro planning coming up, and they have used uh, DHIS2 for micro planning in the past. I think some of the Ugandans in the room could probably, Prosper certainly could elaborate more on that. But the point is that with these maps, you're able to see where people live, right? And you can see that quite quickly. This is quite zoomed out, but if you can zoom in and you can see where the actual structures and buildings are, where people live. And obviously that's a critically important part. You can also see where the health facilities are. And so you can very easily, just like they did in, um, 
uh, which one was Ethiopia here, you can see all of those populations that are quite far away from health facilities, you know, 10 kilometers. And we know that that is a barrier to access that distance. Um, and uh, with these maps, I mean, it, it makes it as obvious as you could possibly get it, certainly. Um, the other one here that was from Lesotho is also extremely interesting because you can see the health facilities. Those are the big dots, right? And you can see the catchments. And you can see that some of these catchments are gigantic. And when, when they were presenting it, they told us we didn't even know people lived here. You know, it's so rural. It's so remote. And now we know we have to go do campaign planning or we have to do uh, outreach to those, those places because there's clearly people there. And it wasn't something that they had an insight into until they built those layers on top of each other, started with the base layer, added the building footprints, added the population, and then it's clear that, the, the, that it's there. Okay, yeah, maybe we can. Oh, okay, so now we've, we've managed to fill up the time, but you know, we live here, so come find us. And we have a session tomorrow as well. Okay, so the break. I think the break's at 10. Oh, sorry, no, we still, you still have to sit here. Well, we can answer some questions off of Zoom. So there was a, sorry, breaks at 10, mis miscommunication. There's a question here in the middle. Okay. Ooh, right. Well, maybe, and then we can come back to Malawi. Oh, yeah. I thought I didn't give that one a show. Yeah. All right, sorry, everyone. Here, then we'll come back to you. I'm going to be so. Uh, sure. Oh, sorry. So I find it interesting. Otherwise, I just want to compliment Arito on what I actually said. So I was looking at uh, a problem at hand here because you'd see if you get into DHS2, generally in terms of coverage, it's generally it's a problem because each time maybe like I would cite our scenario that maybe we want to come up with um, um, a campaign. So there are times we want to get the data. That's when, it, when we are coming up with the micro planning, we have to get uh, data from the districts. In this case, we want to get them, we want them to provide us with the um, national statistical figures and the head count, right? Now, with the geospatial micro planning, in my thinking, I was thinking that um, if DHS2 would be able to provide us with this approach, it means issues to do with coverage is not be a problem because in this case, we we'll not have all these headaches that come in when we are trying to uh, reconcile the figures. There are times people would say, no, maybe we want to use the NSO figures, the National Statistical Office of Figures, and um, the headcount figures. So these do, do not actually reconcile. And then you will see that we want to calculate the coverages. Now that even us, as we are working on the coverages, it's actually tough because at times we need to sit down and say, okay, can we work on the uh, proportions and then come up with these uh, coverages? And you'd see that some districts do not even manage to reach out to those coverages because DHS2 on its own doesn't provide coverages. We have to calculate separately, work on the population, uh, uh, the, the proportions, and then be able to give feedback. So I was of the concern of the missed opportunity for vaccination when it comes to children. That most of the children are actually missed. It's either we underpopulate or we overpopulate. And then these proportions are not always realistic. They're worked on assumptions. Would say, okay, if we are to assign to district by district, how do we ensure that we are really giving real figures? So I was thinking that maybe if we, we may adopt the geospatial microplanning, it's gonna be easy. We'll not have issues to do with coverages because we'll be able to actually track the children that are really supposed to be tracked according to the populations that we are able, able actually to generate. So I was thinking that uh, if we might uh, come in with the um, idea of geospatial uh, analysis, in this case, it's gonna be easy because it will be direct. It will not be this two way where the office has to ask for data. Uh, thus, the, I mean, the, the population figures, these two, the national statistical figures, and at the same time, the uh, head count figures. So to populate these, maybe to reconcile, is always an issue. So I was thinking that maybe if we can have that system in DHIS2, it's going to be easy. And the GTS thing, we hope us to actually reach out 
to the gap that we still feel it's always there over time because we don't have those realistic figures. We, we work on assumptions over time and we really don't speak what happens really on the ground over. So I thought maybe we can still uh, talk a little on the same. Thank you. That's a really good point. And the, the sad reality is that I, I've never worked in a country that wasn't struggling with their population. And Most countries are struggling with this. And um, I think the, the important thing to appreciate is with the maps, you can see where people live. Now, this world pop data is a projection. So it's, not a head, it's not a head count, right? It's a model. So it's not necessarily exactly what you see. It's also from 2020. And as Bjorn pointed out, they are updating it and even providing some new projections. But it is not your national statistics necessarily. Um, but it is a really good place to start. And we and it makes it very easy now to, to use it in the Maps app. Uh, but we have, a, we have actually done a, a, a series of webinars on um, different, on, yeah, different approaches and methodologies to uh, available. It's available on our uh, YouTube channel, but I'm happy to share you some links, but there are and some, certainly some of the WHO colleagues here uh, have a lot of experience in this as well. So um, if you're struggling with coverage indicators, just know that everybody else in the room probably is too. <laughs> and uh, it, then there are different methodologies to, to use, the, uh, to calculate them. Uh, and then of course the MAPS app can be, a, you know, when you put it on the building footprints layer, it's kind of hard to argue with it because it's just, you see where all the buildings are. It's very, very clear. So it makes it quite easy. Yes. Um, yeah, maybe also just to add on, I think one of the things that we're seeing a lot of is how important the actual boundary of the catchment area is when you're trying to reach people. Um, a lot of times the facilities have hand-drawn maps. So, and, and when we ask them to digitize that, we see a lot of gaps and overlaps in what the facility perceives is their catchment area. So when they say, this is my facility headcount or my catchment area, they may be under or overestimating um, what is in their, their catchment boundary just because it's never been properly mapped. Um, so starting with just properly mapping the catchment area, and you can use a tool like Crosscut um, to get kind of a first iteration of that and then sit with the facilities to make sure they are happy with that that can go a long way. And then you can use your census population um, to see maybe it does actually add up. It's just that the boundary was wrong. Um, or you can, you can sit with your facility and then go through that again, use settlement extents that you can write populations to, um, and, and then look at that, um, look at the population again. But the, the, the actual boundaries around your catchment area are really, really important to make sure you get the right population. And that's often an issue that we've seen. Um, maybe just to add, in some countries, we've done um, extensive microplanet um, maps where we've put three different populations. We've put the one from the statistics office, a bottom-up model, which uses a more detailed data um, like from a census cartography and the facility headcount data. And then the facilities could choose what they felt was the most accurate. Um, so, so countries are requesting that as well. Hi, my name's Lily Symes. I work on the PMI VectorLink project. Um, and on our project, we collect quite a lot of entomology data. And there's a lot of interest in being able to map our entomology indicators like vector density and vector composition along with climate data. Um, and mostly that is, you know, looking at monthly changes to climate data at the district level with our entomology indicators. Um, so far, we've noticed that the climate layers, um, we're seeing a lot of data at the weekly level, and there are differences in um, what that time period is based on the source of the climate data that's coming through. So we're just wondering if there's any possible or expected functionality of kind of aggregating um, climate data at different time periods or flexibility in, in those time periods that are available within MAPS.
So, um, sorry, I need a, uh, I need help on this one. Uh, the answer is yes. It's something that we're we're looking very much into having more granular climate data, but maybe Kristen to. Yeah. So, so um, we have a we have a uh, an own session on climate health uh, tomorrow, actually. So, so please uh, join that one. We have uh, several initiatives uh, around in the countries, and there is uh, a growing demand for combining climate data with health data to be able to predict, prevent, understand the impact of climate on health issues. We are in the process, I mean, we could say that, I think it's not a secret. We are in the process of, uh, we actually just handed in a proposal for Welcome Trust on a big project, eight years project, uh, with 12 PhD students involving many countries on investigating the impact that the climate health has on uh, health data. So we hope we will start a big initiative, but we don't know yet. It will be decided during summer, so cross all the fingers. But we really believe anyway, even though we're not getting those funds, we believe that that's a growing demand and it's very important to address uh, issues when it comes to um, weather data, climate data, meteorological data for the first, impact on, and we know already we have done it on malaria, dengue, and nutrition. So we, we know already there, there's evidence, but we will encourage people uh, in countries to take contact with climate uh, communities at the universities, uh, at meteorological stations, to start the discussion to see how can we combine uh, data from various sectors in order to to solve or to at least address societal challenges so, such as climate health. So this is a kind of a, a call for action. And we will have some examples uh, in the plenary uh, on Thursday when we are talking about uh, cross-sector uh, monitoring. Um, so there will be examples. And we actually have a session at uh, three o'clock today, uh, monitoring progress, uh, progress across sectors in Auditoria One, where we actually look at the SDGs to see how we can combine data analytics across sectors. And many of these indicators are climate relevant indicators. So yes, this is an, very much an up and coming topic for, for us all. Maybe I could just add one thing about that specific question. Uh, I worked fairly extensively on a proposal on climate health and uh, the issue of granularity and matching geographical scale comes up in every climate health use case. And uh, the way to address that is by creating customized climate services per use case, which we're planning to work with a few new partners in the climate sciences demand to do. Uh, so that will probably be a combination of local climate data where available, globally modeled climate data, um, but designed to match a given health use case. So we're, uh, we have discussed that with a few different climate partners who are hoping to join us in the Welcome Project. And once those become available, uh, to the extent that those can be made generic and made available for different countries and different contexts, that's obviously the goal as with any DHS2 pro uh, product. Um, but if you're interested, I definitely recommend getting in touch with us because the first step of that, if we do receive the uh, approval for our project proposal, we'll be selecting countries and use cases to work with uh, in trying to move forward and develop some viable systems. And just to add, um, if there are any knowledge about where ministries are sharing data, we are very interested to kind of leverage upon that to see how, what can we do in order to show, um, or as I usually say, create hope. Uh, show examples where we actually can uh, do see the benefit from from matching data from local weather data with uh, climate local um, health data, because um, for you know on satellites that has been available for quite a while. But it's the same as with maps. The more the lower you go in your you know in the locality, the more relevant they are. So, so we need to think about that in, in when it comes to climate as well. Uh, I would also advise you to have a look at the Google Earth engine, just Google it and see the data repository. It's a West West resource and the, that's climate change is a big issue for them as well. And they are constantly adding new data layers. 
So, but it's uh, if someone you could have a look if you're working within the field and see if there are more data sets that we could also add to the DHS2 uh, instance to the maps app. So please have a look and, and give us feedback. Okay, I think we have time for one more question before the break. This side of the room seems to be a bit more tired than this side of the room. Are there any questions over here? Yeah, of course, George always. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. So I have one comment and one question. So the OrgUni profile is really spectacular. I've come across it recently. Um, the other thing that has impressed me, what from Bjorn said, is that I realized that you could have like the data table at the bottom of the map but you were just clicking around with the filters and I realized that you could actually use it for real-time analysis. And that's really interesting because now I realized that instead of having to create five, six, seven different maps, like, you know, all the zeros or all the ones, you can actually just have one map and give an explanation to dynamically use it like um, on the fly. That's, that's great. And the stupid question is, how do I edit the org unit profile? Uh, currently, because this is a one-time job, we have not prioritized to make this into a nice user thing. So there is an, uh, an API you need to set. It's fairly well described, uh, sending a request to this API, and it's done as a one-time job, and it will keep and it will be there. So this one basically selects which sort of elements and, and uh, uh, like metadata attributes or, or unit groups, uh, what kind of indicators and data elements you want to see. But uh, I see uh, we will, I will take a second round of getting a user interface for this as well. <laughs> you have to, you have to. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we, a, pointing at an API link is, <laughs> is a bit tough. Um, okay. We're still we're still just a few more minutes away from tea. Any other questions? Last question. No. Silence is acceptance. Okay. One thing I just want because uh, this was uh, this been a great process this last half year. Uh, having a workshop in Nairobi and then leading up to the academy at the same time working on the maps app trying to improve features so I just want to especially thank uh, Sylvia and Maria from UNICEF and also uh, Nora from HISP South Africa for organizing the academy which was a lot of work uh, it's super useful also for us as developers and also people sitting in Oslo come out in the field learn about the use cases see how this is used we were 2014 <laughs> different his groups represented uh, on this and, and it is super useful and sometimes someone from the outside needs to come and, and bring us together so I'm very thankful that you did this job I hope this we will continue this great cooperation for the future as well. Thank you. <laughs>